have a microphone that's located over on the side of the room for whatever questions you guys may have. Uh, I kindly ask one question per person, and just be careful. There is a thing on the wall that'll turn the lights out if you were here for Christopher Lloyd. Yeah. I mean, we're in the dark for a few moments. So try not to touch the lights on the side, but uh, are you guys ready to get this panel underway? Yeah. It is my Skull and have to ask to be the right skull for the right show, and, and uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate the folks. So, you know, it's a, uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery or something. So, I, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> so, so growing up, what were some of your fandoms? Were you into comic books? There's at a all? Green Lantern right oh, there. Oh, there he is. Yeah, that's looking good, oh. buddy. I see some bunny ears over there. <laughs> that looks good. Yeah. That looks great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, w were you into comic books growing up? What were some of your fandoms before getting oh, to play? I was a total comic book geek. Yes, absolutely. I grew up uh, absolutely raiding the local comic book shop in, uh, let's see, we had one in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and it was called Barbarian Books. And they sold used books and uh, comics and old comics. And I used to haunt that place every chance I got. Bought up all the books I could. I grew up in the 80s. I guess I was a kid in the 80s. So there's a good Punisher t-shirt right on. Yes, sir. <laughs> and um, uh, the 1980s uh, found some great comics called Twisted Tales and Alien Worlds. They were by this company called Pas Pacific Comics. They were out of California, but they had the best artists, and they were all like series, like you know, uh, science. Alien Worlds was like four science fiction stories. Twisted Tales would be like four horror stories. Great art, great writing by this guy named Bruce Jones, who wrote most of them. And I, I, those were my absolute favorite. And then I got into uh, Mad Magazine, yeah. which uh, is still around. Is Mad still around? But I was around, you know, when, I, when they were putting it out, when I was a kid, there were the original guys who started in the 50s, and it was actually originally a comic book. I think for the first nine, ten issues or so, it was, a, and then they traded, traded for the magazine format. Um, so I fell in love with the old Mads, you know, they made fun of everything, yeah. uh, Super Duper Man, yeah. and all, all kinds of great, great uh, spoofs on uh, famous characters and stuff. And uh, that, I didn't really get into superheroes. I had a few Batman, I thought he was cool, but I never really got into this whole superhero Marvel. And the reason was because it felt like a big, drawn out soap opera, <laughs> you know, which, which was novel, you know. I mean, Stan Lee invented that whole thing with the Fantastic Four, and you know, they were bickering amongst each other, and it, and it brought this new life into superhero comics. I just never. Personally, I was much more into war, horror, uh, sci-fi, uh, and then, of course, underground comics. When they came, when they, I discovered those, that blew my mind. That's Robert Crumb, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, the fabulous furry Freak Brothers by Bill oh. Sheldon. I mean, they did some badass stuff. Zap comics, um, and I really got into collecting that. There was a great one called Corn Fed. 
corn-fed comics. It's just, you know, and they're great, but the artists are like weird, and they 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 uh, they blew my mind, you know, because they they subversive and talked, you know, you know, pot smokers and all all the kind of stuff your mom definitely does not want you checking out when you're 12, 13 years old, and uh, fell in love with that stuff. So they came after me for the Punisher. I originally turned it down because uh, I was like, yeah. Just not a superhero type of person. It's just not my, you know. And I was younger, and I was like, I'm only going to do movies that I would want to watch, and that kind of thing. And, um, and which, you know, I still am. I still am that way, I guess. But uh, you know, they finally called me up and they said, Listen, man, the Punisher is not a superhero. He's an anti-hero. You know, he doesn't have any superpowers. He's got big guns and he kills people <laughs> and uh, bad guys and. And that's what kind of got me to take a second look at it and, and do the movie and, and uh, really fell in love with the fans of uh, Punisher. There was a website that was new at the time. It was called Superhero Hype. You guys heard of that? Superhero Hype? Yeah? Are they still around or? Uh, we don't know. But yeah, they, that was the forum where you could go on and just talk. And it was all comics at the time because there weren't that many movies that had been done with TV shows and all the old stuff. But Superhero Hype had a thread on all the favorite characters. And so I started checking out Superhero Hype about Frank Castle and the Punisher. And that's sort of where I learned all the things that everybody loved about the character. And, uh, and I, I read that religiously, like every day while I was uh, working out and preparing to do the role. Uh, so that, that's, where, that's where I got my... Uh, my love of uh, Frank Castle and, and that world, and then fought uh, to uh, to make that as close to the comics as, as we as we could, you know. Unfortunately, a movie called Batman hadn't come out yet with Christopher Nolan's Batman. When that one, I think, came out like a year later or something, and that's when everybody realized that you could do a dark superhero movie. But but when Punisher came out, nobody thought that was a thing. And I was like, no, they're gonna love it because I was reading superhero hype and I, and I knew what folks wanted to see. But you know, the, the business, the corporate people were like, eh, I don't see that working. Comic book movie? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, this is the opposite of that. This is the antidote uh, to superhero movies. But, and you know, we were just early to the, uh, to the party gap there. I think you started the party. I mean, I, 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 I loved the movie. I loved your portrayal. Um, and since we're talking about comic books, I, I see that you also co-wrote your own comic book miniseries, Bad yeah, Planet. I did. I, you know, <clears throat> doing The Punisher. By the way, how many people have seen my short film, uh, Dirty Laundry? <laughs> yeah, that's a few. Uh, so anybody who likes The Punisher and, and all that, it's on YouTube. It's called, just go on there and type in Dirty Laundry. And uh, it's about 10 minutes long, and I'm very proud of that because uh, I, I sort of shepherded that to life, came up with the idea and the short and brought in buddies to write it and direct it and pay for it. So that was really a creation uh, that, uh, that I'm proud of. Um, I met a bunch of comic book artists and writers and all those guys at Comic-Con San Diego um, promoting the Punishers. But I got, but you know, well, they're all wanting me to hang out with the movie people. I was wanting to hang out with the comic book people and check out all the art and all that. And that's when I got a bunch of guys together and we started uh, our own comic book company. It's called Raw Studios. And we did a couple of science fiction books, <laughs> true to form. And uh, we, we, one's called Alien Pig Farm 3000. <laughs> Very proud of that one. It, it's about, a, it takes place in Kentucky. And it's this, these, uh, these two brothers, and they're making moonshine, and they're still blows up, and it reveals a buried spaceship that's been there for like 400 years, and it wakes up the creatures inside, and they start, the creatures start stealing, uh, stealing the farmer's pigs to eat. And so the, the guys get together, and they gotta, you know, kill the aliens and keep them from eating their pigs. Uh, we had a lot of fun with that. That, that was going to be a movie for a little while. <laughs> for some reason, we didn't get very far. I'd like to see it. I think that'd be fun. 
Well, uh, you were talking about wanting to do projects that you're passionate about, and you had mentioned to me that in September, you have a film that, com uh, that comes out that stars you and your daughter called Dig. So can, that's right. can yeah. you tell us about working with your daughter? That's so well, awesome. I didn't even know she was an actor until, uh, until <laughs> she, she's like, Dad, I want to audition for this movie. And, and it was a movie about father and a daughter, and they, get, they go through something terrible, and then they go through something terrible again. They get kidnapped by some bad guys, played by uh, one of them, uh, Emile Hirsch. He's a wonderful actor. And it's called Dig, and that comes out to September 23rd. Very proud of that one. My daughter uh, auditioned for the movie and uh, submitted it just like anybody else, and you know, and she was fantastic. And the, the director called me up, and the writer and the producers, they were all like, she can act, what the hell? And she's your daughter. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and it turns out she did a great job. And now she's a little actor. I mean, they say sometimes it skips a generation of talent, but not with her. So I'm very proud of her. And now she's, she just did a movie in uh, Brooklyn, New York. We filmed that, and uh, she's auditioning and, and, you know, getting the door slammed in her face like every other actor that uh, goes out there and tries, tries to get a gig, you know? I'm saying probably about, I'd say about, 400 to one, something like that. In other words, 400 doors slam in your face for every one that opens as an actor. And, uh, and so you gotta develop a thick skin, you know. Um, but she certainly certainly got what it takes. Very proud of, of her. And Dig's a pretty good little movie. Um, can't remember where it comes out. But it's been, it'll be, oh, it's in theaters in New York and LA, but uh, like everything now, it's streaming on one of the streamers. Too hard to find. We'll find it. Yeah, we, we will. Uh, I, of course, wanted to ask about uh, working with the iconic Billy Crystal. And uh, obviously, he's a Yankee lover. Uh, so, <laughs> what was it like uh, initially, like auditioning with for, for the movie? And how long did it take for you before you felt like you could accurately swing the bat? Yeah, that was a process. I, I grew up playing football, so I, you know, and, but of course as an actor, one of the first things you learn is that anybody, producer, director, if they ever ask if you can do something, the answer is yes. You know, you ride a horse, yes. You ride a horse backwards and uh, do a backflip, yes I can. Uh, so, you know, Billy's like, play baseball? I was like, yep. <laughs> I've played baseball ever since I was this tall. You know? and, uh, and then we get out there and, um, you know, and one of the things Billy told me at the audition, you know, we were he's meeting him at his fancy office in Beverly Hills, and, and he's looking at me, and he goes, turn around, turn around, will you? And so I, you know, you always feel like you're a fucking model or something when you audition <laughs> for people, you know? And they all just like, screw in the back, I'm like, I don't know, I just like, he's five foot ten. <laughs> you know, and then turn around. He said, so I turn around and he goes, ah, he goes, from the back, you look just like Mickey Mantle. <laughs> <laughs> you notice in the movie, he does film me from the back quite a bit. His vision, his vision. Uh, so fortunately, we had a great trainer, uh, Reggie Smith, uh, ran a baseball camp out in the valley outside of Los Angeles, and he trained everybody. He was great. Uh, one of the true great teachers of my life was, was Reggie, and he taught me from the ground up, you know, and, and the first thing he said was, well, it's, you know, I, of course I told him, I go, listen, dude, I have no fucking idea how to play baseball. We got six weeks. <laughs> and, uh, and he goes, well, you ain't got no bad habits. That's good, I can work with that. And uh, he wouldn't even let me swing a bat for the first uh, two weeks, maybe a week. He, would, he wouldn't even let me touch one. He had a samurai sword and a two by four. <laughs> and he'd make me balance on the two by four and swing a samurai sword in the air. And he'd, and he'd close his eyes and he could tell what I was doing wrong from the sound that the blade made through the air. Well, uh, yeah. It was Awesome. He was, he, was, he was like a sensei, you know. And uh, and he did 
he built it up from the ground up, you know. And, and it wasn't just learning to play baseball, it was, it was um, learning to, to play baseball like Mickey Mantle. You know, Mickey's, everybody has, has a different swing. Mickey's swing, Mickey's run. Mickey got injured on it. I think it was his rookie season, he was catching a pop fly from Willie Mays. And his, uh, in his left uh, cleat hit one of those sprinklers in the outfield and he twisted his knee. So for the rest of his career, he had this slight limp, you know, and getting that fucking limp was probably the toughest thing that I had to try to do, you know, just getting Billy maybe do it over and over, hitting a home run, runner, you know, taking that home run, run around the bases and trying to get that little limp, you know, and I'd come in and be like, Billy be like, eh, you know, back off on him a little bit, and I'd do it again, eh, make it a little bit more. And I, I remember doing that over and over, and, but, but very proud of the work that we all did on that movie. It was back in the days when you could carry a baseball bat on an airplane. And um, yeah, <clears throat> it, was, it was before 9-11, so I'd fly to be, go do some press or go shoot another movie or whatever I was doing, and I'd bring my baseball bat right on the plane with my carry-on luggage, and the pilot would go, hey, you want me to put that behind the seat? You know, behind the pilot seat. And so he, the pilot would put the baseball bat behind his, behind his uh, pilot chair, and, uh, and then he'd hand it back to me at the end of the flight. That, yeah, it was so because I was swing that fucking thing 500 times a day in the in the hotel rooms, you know, trying not to hit the furniture. And, uh, Any every, mishaps? Everywhere I went, you know, I took, I took that baseball bat with me. I'm pretty proud of the, uh, the swing that we ended up getting with that. You know, never never hit a home run in Tiger Stadium. We painted Tiger Stadium, which, by the way, they tore down Tiger Stadium after we shot there, and the footage of them tearing down Tiger Stadium is part of the credits for this show I did called Hung on HBO. So you're watching Hung and, and you're seeing them tear down the stadium where we shot 61. I just thought that was kind of cool. Um, not that we lost Tiger Stadium, that's a bummer. But we, we painted the whole thing Yankee Green, and of course, you know, my goal was to hit a, hit a home run in, in Tiger Stadium. I hit a lot of home runs in practice, but you know, you're getting up there and you only have, you know, as soon as you hit the ball and the swing is good, we're moving on to another shot. So I, I never got enough shots at it to, to, to knock one out of the park. I came close though. In the left field, I came real close to hit the wall. Left field, outfield wall. Cool. Closest I got. So have you followed the sport since you did the film? <clears throat> no. <laughs> Fair enough. Nope. <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up with it, you know, when teams were teams and the players would stick together and I mean, the name of the team meant something because it was the same group of guys pretty much, plus or minus like one dude, it was year after year. And, so, and, and once they started trading every year, it's like a whole different team. It's like, what's the point of even keeping the same name? It's like, it just became boring for me because I, I like the team of it, you know, you see your team win lose, but it's your team. I don't get that same feeling anymore. Fair enough. Um, so if it's okay with you, we're going to take some questions from the audience. We do have a microphone that's set up over there. Any willing victim? They have to yeah. put themselves on the spotlight here. Does that thing float around? Or? <laughs> Come on. You just got to grab a mic. Go for it. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Check, check. Thanks. Hey. Sir, I want to say, first of all, I appreciate you being here. Um, you know better than anybody, you have a super loyal fan base, so you spend a weekend here with us, means a lot. You've been my hero since I was 12 years old when I've seen The Punisher in theaters, man. So this is a dream come true. Um, I appreciate that, pal. Thank you. Um, so if, you know, had you and Jonathan Hensley and the, you know, the, the team of the original Punisher kept creative rights and creative control before that all went to hell, you know, um, can you give us any kind of idea on what a Punisher 2 that we all wanted might have looked like had you had the full length film, you know, plot points, what it, you know, what it looked like right up to the point that it was canceled? Well, we, we never got, we got, there were a couple iterations of Punisher 2. One of them was with Rob Zombie directing, which I thought would have been interesting, you know, but uh, that was one iteration and, you know, we were batting around, 
script ideas and trying to find the director, the Marvel folks uh, wanted to go with a different director. Um, and that, that was their choice. So uh, it was like, who was that person going to be? And we went through a number of different sort of folks. And then I ended up with Walter Hill. Oh, cool. Who, if you guys are familiar oh, yeah. with Walter Hill, you guys know the great Walter Hill. He directed 48 Hours. Um, he's uh, an immense, immensely talented motherfucker. Uh, what was it? The Driver it was a fantastic movie. Uh, he did one with uh, Bronson, Hard Times, I think it's called, where he plays a bare knuckle boxer. These are great films, people. These are like the films that sculpted my, my childhood, right? And he's like, he was like a no-nonsense, great action, but, but economical, like sparse dialogue. He had a great sense of humor, but he was really good with, uh, with action. And then, you know, he, he was like, a, he's a man's man's director, right? Um, and I, we, we met, we fell in love with each other and went to, to uh, the studio and said, and, and Walter said, listen, I'll write it. Directed, that'll be that, and uh, and they and they ended up saying no to to Walter Hill for reasons that are beyond my ability to uh, comprehend, and um, that's when I said, uh, okay, well, if you're not going to make the perfect Punisher film with the perfect guy, then I, who else do you got? And, they floated another director who was not, who hadn't really done any, anything in that in that ballpark, and and, and so that's when I had to uh, I had to pull out, you know, I, I had to say, listen, uh, I'm not sure if you guys really understand what it is you're doing, and therefore chances of fucking this up are pretty high. <laughs> um, the the idea that I liked that we never really. We never really got far on, but the idea that I was pushing was there's a Punisher uh, uh, series called Circle of Blood, written by, I think it's Stephen Grant. Stephen, does anybody know? Uh, I think his name is, well, I know his last name is Grant. And Circle of Blood is essentially the Punisher gets fucking arrested and he gets thrown into the penitentiary and every guy in there wants to kill him because then he had a hand in putting away like all these dudes. And so it was like he was going into the lion's den. And of course he got it. He put himself there on purpose because he was after this one dude that was ungettable, right? So he got himself put away in federal uh, penitentiary to go after these guys. I thought that's a great, we could have so much fun doing that. Um, but so that's about as far as we got with that. Thank you, I appreciate it. Hi, I was wondering, can we look forward to you seeing any more of the YouTube short films like Dirty Laundry? Oh yeah, no, you, you never say never. I mean, come up with something fun. Um, we, we, we've, we've talked about it, you know. And it's come up with something that, that uh, people would really get a kick out of. And, and what that would be, uh, I, know, I don't really know at the moment, but I would never say no. You know, well, I, would no. I would certainly look forward to it and if you did several, and even if you did a, a crossover with, um, like I know the MCU does a lot of like multiverse, and if you went with uh, John Berthold's Punisher. I, I love, I love Berthold. He's we 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 were friendly a long time ago, and uh, he's a great guy, fantastic actor, and he looks a lot more like the Punisher than than I, you know, me with my blonde hair and a little bit. He just got that kind of like thick, like Italian fucking like, he just, he, he fits the profile. Uh, if I was ever gonna direct the Punisher film, I'd, I'd use Bernthal, because I think he's terrific. Um, yeah, and when we premiered Dirty Laundry, we didn't say anything about it, we finished the film, and then Comic-Con San Diego was coming up, and so we, we went down there and we printed up these little flyers, and I bet you some fans who were there that year have these flyers, like that I would love to see. Because we printed up these flyers and we didn't say anything, we said and we rented out a room with, with a big screening room on there, but we didn't tell anybody what it was. But we essentially put on a flyer like, if you're a Punisher fan, you want to be in this room at this time. And we'd hand them out uh, during the show, and then I think it was a Sunday or something, uh, afternoon, uh, we, we went into this room, not unlike this room right here, and there's a, a 
bunch of people there and they had no idea what they were gonna see. And we just turned out the lights and ran the fucking thing. And they lost their minds. It was so fun, you know? So cool. Like the people that actually showed up, like, all right, I'll check this out. I don't know. No idea what it's gonna be, but I'm, I'm a Punisher fan. Let's see what's going on. And, uh, and that was a fun, that was a fun moment. Really. Yeah. Thomas Jane, what is your, f what was your favorite movie to act in? Hey, I'd say uh, probably 61 because you get to make a movie and play baseball all day. And of course I fell in love with the sport by learn learning the sport. And uh, I mean, I played stickball as a kid. You know, you get an old, uh, you get one of those old hard cardboard tubing things, right? But they're real thick and they like, Long and, we, and we used to play stickball with a racquetball, a little racquetball. That was really fun, and I got pretty good at that game. Um, that was as close to baseball as I got, but learning how to play baseball, playing the sport, doing it every day, and then making a movie, which I love to do. So it was a great combination. It's probably the most fun. And then you got Billy Crystal, who's cracking jokes all day long. It was, it was, it's hard to beat that one. I'd say, I'd say that. And of course, the punishment was a lot of fun, but it was a lot of work. I mean, fuck, man. That was a lot of work. <laughs> Thank you. Great back. question. All right, we have about five minutes left. Uh, the Mist. I introduced Ooh. my wife to that movie, uh, and she was enjoying it as much as I enjoy it until the end. Uh, <laughs> and she's never gotten over it, and she's I hate that movie. I never want to see yeah, it. I, I, just, I, would, I would just love to hear what you have to say about how they worked well, on that movie. And it's definitely a love-hate relationship with that, you know, people either love it or hate it, and you know, the twist ending is of course something that I always really love from my love of comic book, the horror comics and the sci-fi comics, they always had a twist ending, and so that was what we were, you know, following that, that formula, and tell a great story and then twist it at the end, to where, where no, and nobody expects it to go there, and it goes there. That people at love that, right? So it's either like in their top ten, or it's in their bottom fucking thousand. They're like never again. Or I want to watch that. And you know, they, they did screw up. The company that released the movie decided that the perfect day to release The Mist would be the fa the family day of the year, when when most families go see a movie, and that's Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving Day weekend is when they decided, hey, it's a great time, not Halloween or, you know, some any other day of the year. They probably picked the worst day of the year to release that film because it's all family sitting in the theater. And they're like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, it was brutal. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to know. What was it like working with Kevin Nash before and after you stabbed him? <laughs> yeah. Just bring that up, didn't I? Yeah, it's one of the dark days of my career, I can tell you that. Anybody who doesn't know, we, I, I was doing a fight scene with Kevin in The Punisher, and they. Right, and this ha rarely happens, but it happened, you know, that somehow the, the real knife. Somebody forgot to change out the real knife for the prop knife. So, you know, and it's a big scene, I'm swinging around and I gotta grab his thing and stab him and of course I fucking stabbed him. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it went in probably, you know, something like a half inch or something. And, you know, his breastbone stopped it, stopped it. And, 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 but yeah, it was bad. <laughs> You're looking up at the dude, he's a foot and a half tall. I got a knife sticking in him. <laughs> Uh, and all, he just stood there. He just fucking stood there and smiled, <laughs> which made it even worse. <laughs> yeah, that was a tough day. That was one of those days where you know a case of beer just isn't gonna. Uh, not, not good enough, buddy. <laughs> but he did. He took it. He, he was very gracious, and uh, I always respect him for that. <laughs> Right, we have time for about one or two more questions. Uh, I'm asking about the mask also. I loved it, loved it. Uh, now Stephen King said that he actually preferred the movie ending over the story. Before you went into it, had you read the short story and which ending do you think was the story? Well, a big 
big Stephen King fan here. I've read a lot of his books and fell in love with him as a young person. I still think he's one of the, in a hundred years, people are still gonna be reading Stephen King. They write him off as a popular novelist or something. He's a fucking craftsman and he's an artist and his stuff will live forever because it's so character based. And Stephen, we got to have dinner when we were shooting The Mist and, and he said, uh, Stephen King said, you know, if I'd have thought of that ending, I'd have put it out. That's what I would have said. And that was a pretty great compliment to, to Darabont. Can I read the second book, 1922? Of the two vehicles in The Punisher, which one was your favorite? The 68 GTO or the green Plymouth? Well, I was, was pushing for a more uh, off the beaten path uh, car. That car, the, G, the, the GTO, is such a classic. It's like so classic that, you know, they're. It's just too popular. It's like, it's not Frank Castle. He's more like, he's got like a Mercury Cougar. You know, he's got like a Roadrunner. It's like, and that, that's what I was put, of course they went for the, the flashy, you know, uh, car, which so, that, you know, that was never my favorite. I drove a 69 Camaro convertible, you know, when I was 16, that's what I spent my money on. Uh, but it was matte black and, and uh, it went straight real fast. <laughs> you don't want to do, do too many turns. <laughs> but it was a great driver and, uh, you know, I was, I, I, so, you know, it was one of the battles I lost. Yeah, the other people took my questions of all the Punisher in the mid, so that's why I asked about the car. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great question. Appreciate it. All right, this is going to be the final question. I apologize. Well, we can go fast. Are, are you okay with that? Okay, great. Yeah, uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Um, I really enjoyed your work on The Expanse. It's a touch of Miller. I was wondering if you had any quick uh, humor stories about what it was like working on that show. Oh, no, it was great. We had a blast. Uh, Toronto was freezing, man. And we always ended up there in the wintertime. You know, it's so cold that your eyelashes would stick together and you blinked. So that wasn't fun. Uh, you know, I will, the only thing I'll tell you is that I just had a call recently with uh, Amazon, and they they were calling me to ask if I would be interested in doing like a Miller spinoff. Is that a good idea? Yeah. 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 You, you like that idea? Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, I don't know, that didn't sound too enthusiastic. <laughs> 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 so I told him, yeah. Question, but would you ever consider doing a horror movie with, with uh, James Wan as a director? Yeah, I mean, I love that kind of stuff, you know, if there, but it's really hard to make a good horror movie. I mean, most of them suck balls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's true, man, and I love horror. I watch more horror than I'd like to admit to, but, because when they're great, when they're good, they're great, right? And then, then they suck, they suck. <laughs> Uh, my question is, there's a scene in The Punisher where you're torturing the character Mickey with a popsicle. How fun was that for you, and did you have to do that over and over again? Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, like, we, we had a lot of popsicles on standby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fucking freezer full of popsicles. You know, the prop guy had had fun on that show. You know. So it was, it was, uh, yeah, just one every day in the office. <laughs> Thank you. So like a lot of people, I really loved uh, Dirty Laundry. So I was wondering, um, I was really impressed with how much you pack into those 10 minutes. Um, and I've never looked at a bottle of Jack Daniels the same way again. Um, but I was wondering if, um, is it like really challenging to put that much in a 10 minutes versus doing a full length uh, movie? Absolutely, you know, in a lot of ways it's the same, you know, you're just telling a story in 10 instead of 100 minutes. and. Uh, you want to be doing it right. You want to pack. You want to do exactly that. You know, and it's amazing how fast we can follow a story. You know, and that's why I'm not a real big fan of television because they take fucking ten years to tell a story that you could have done in a fucking half hour. Uh, you know, my daughter was so good at watching Game of Thrones. We'd watch it on the couch, and she'd be on her computer, and I'm looking at her. You're not even watching. You know, and she, and, but she knew exactly when to look up and see the one scene. That and then boom, she came back. 
And I was like, that's like a sixth sense or something. <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe was the master of the short story, and uh, you know one of the things he said was uh, was not there not one word should be wasted in a short film. Every single word should have a purpose to be there, and uh, we try to try to do the same thing with film. You know, and we fail a lot uh, at that. But when you get it right, you know it's it's really rewarding. I think you definitely got it right. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Yes, that is the final question. Hi, my name is Olivia. Um, Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, I am actually a very big fan of the movie Boogie Nights. Um, I wanted to know if you could just quickly let me know how that experience was working with the late Philip Seymour Hoffman and, of course, the late Greg Reynolds. Yeah, I, I can tell you that the you know I was just like an, a, a street punk actor in Hollywood and got this audition and. Uh, and ended up getting the call back, and the call back was Philip Seymour Hoffman and uh, John C. Riley and myself in in this office, you know, uh, sitting on a couch, like and the three of us sit on a couch, and Paul was just like, "All right, go," <laughs> without any direction or dialogue, nothing. We were just supposed to just sort of just hang out on the couch together. And um, for whatever reason, just that chemistry worked, you know? It was like, that's what he was doing. He was seeing what, what actors work best with the actors to create that, that group, you know, of, of people. I think we got nominated for a SAG Award for Best Ensemble uh, cast, and, and that's how it's done, you know? It's, it, it, just let the actors do their thing and live together and see, see what the dynamic is. And we were, we were cracking him up within like 30 seconds, and, it was probably one of the best auditions I've ever had, just because it was so free and so fun. Well, I thought you did a great job. Oh, hey. So thank you very thank much. You. Now, who do I give this to? <laughs> <laughs> right on. Appreciate it. Yeah, we'll just leave it there. Yeah. Thank well, you, Dylan. Thanks for uh, hanging out with me for a little while, folks. It's called Trapo, T-R-O-P-P-O, -P -P Trapo. It's an Australian slang for uh, being driven crazy by the tropical heat, you know? The Australians pop off and take their clothes off and start running down the street drunk, and he's like, oh, he's going to Trapo. <laughs> so that's the name of the show, and it's, it's pretty darn good. It's getting real good uh, reviews and all that crap, but, but people have been, been telling me that they really enjoy it. It's, it's a fun, it's a fun, um, Little series. I think we only did like eight of them or something. So you can burn through it in, in a weekend. And, uh, and I, I would recommend it. It's, it's a good little drama. It's a lot of fun. So that's uh, that's all for you. Thank you so much. This has been such a I'll joy. I'll be down at the uh, downstairs, you know, signing some autographs and stuff. So maybe I'll see you guys down there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.